My name is Dr. Gernot Krömer. I am uh, the president of the Austrian Space Forum and I'm also a certified and licensed analog astronaut of the Austrian Space Forum. I've uh, conducted more than uh, 10 field missions now in Mars analog regions on this planet and I um, consider myself as one of the shipbuilders for human missions to Mars. In the following I would like to share with you what you're going to do once you have certified spacesuit simulators. When you have the tools, when you have uh, the people, you go to areas which are as Mars-like as possible on this planet. And there, is a, uh, there are many, many regions on our planet which look like Mars, uh, which have some you know, mineralogical similarity, which have a similar history, who have a similar topography, for example. And the reason for this is that we really love to get our hands dirty. The important thing here is that you stumble across many, many things you haven't thought about once you go to the outside, as opposed to merely working in theory or merely working in the laboratory. So whenever things break, uh, we, we should be grateful actually for that, because every mistake we make during those missions is one mistake we're hopefully not going to make once we are Mars. So let me share with you some of the stories and the journeys we had on our way to the red planet. So let me introduce the uh, organization behind this. I'm uh, working for the Austrian Space Forum, which is a kind of a, a research entity mixed with a, with a uh, asso volunteer association with also a little bit of a commercial part. So we are a citizen science and research organization with a very vibrant outreach component. We have roughly more than 150 members all across Austria with a few staff members in the core team, so to say, and uh, more than one fourth of them are actually space professionals who are working in agencies and other companies and so on. Because in Austria, we do not have a, a classical space agency like NASA on a smaller scale or so, so we have to do the research ourselves in a way. So what we are doing here is an organization which is doing fundamental research on one side with a focus on Mars exploration, human space flight, astrobiology on one side, and on the other side we're doing lots of outreach. So we love to go to the public, we go to kindergartens, to schools, we, go, we do street science, uh, so just to communicate the things we are actually researching on, to really get a level of authenticity which is unprecedented in Austria. From the research point of view, we are focusing on hardware development like uh, spacesuit design. Uh, we're building uh, elements for our first nanosatellite, for example. We work on plant air protection, on plant air surface operations in high fidelity environments. And we're putting all those things to a test in during those field campaigns. And this is integrated in a multi-year program to have a, a cohesive workflow, you know, a, a basically something which is a framework with, with a very small set of key framing questions which we follow year after year to have a coherent approach and a very harmonized approach how we do the, our science within the framework of the Polaris program. So we are building, for example, the spacesuit simulator ODA-X, a 45 kilogram space cuff to wear. It's one of the most advanced uh, Mars spacesuit simulators we have on this planet right now. There are four teams worldwide which are working on the topic and we're the only European team developing Mars simulators. We are going to areas like uh, Rio Tinto, southern Spain. This is an area where we think it's probably the best model region for wet and early Mars 3.5 billion years ago. You have to understand that Mars nowadays is a dry, cold desert with almost no liquid water on the surface, for example. However, we believe that Mars was much more Earth-like up to 3.5 billion years ago. It had water, it had standing bodies of water like oceans with up to three kilometers water depth. You could go deep sea diving on Mars 3.5 billion years ago. And we still see the traces of this ocean back now. Now the idea is that if Mars once was more habitable, had warmer atmosphere, had more water, had a higher atmospheric pressure, had a conceivable, you know, a strong magnetic magnetic field, it had all the ingredients for the uh, genesis of life. The question is, if Mars was habitable, was it also inhabited? These are two very different things and we don't know if the one thing leads to the other. Now, to study those mechanisms and to, to, to perfectionize the, the workflows, we're going to those Mars-like areas like Rio Tinto. We do not do this alone, but we do this in partnership with many other organizations like European Space Agency or NASA and so on. 
uh, and uh, work, for example, on human robotic workflows. Like the picture you see here, that's the, the most expensive car I've ever driven. That is uh, the uh, Eurobot Ground prototype. It's a machine which has been in development for almost 10 years and we're the first ones to make it dirty. I'm very proud of that. And uh, it's a machine which is not only a car, but it's also with its robotic manipulators. It can help you to carry boxes, to follow autonomously the astronaut, for example. There's a voice command available or so. So just a half a year ago, it was actually telecommanded from the space station by the German astronaut uh, Alexander Gerst, who was getting his driving license from the orbit, so to say. Now, these are model regions where you can study the human robotic interaction in a comprehensive workflow. So this is not an isolated research, but we're trying to mimic the most important steps of uh, human exploratory activities on the red planet. But we do not only do this uh, on the surface, uh, we also go subsurface. Now the reason for this is that um, we have good reason to believe there are cave systems on Mars. Uh, we actually found the entrance to some of those cave systems and they are a, a, a Disneyland for astrobiologists. And the reason for this is that they have a very good protection from radiation, meteorites, they offer a very stable, benign thermal environment. Uh, and um, so if, if life ever arose on Mars, that's a big if, of course, huh? if it ever arose on Mars, and then the environmental parameters were getting worse and worse and worse, get colder, lose the water, the radiation increases and so on. You would, what you would see probably is that life would retreat to more benign areas and would survive there. So we call this the Swan Sea Ecologies, where the last songs of life were sung, so to say. And these were exactly the places where I would love to go to look for life. So if I would have a wish to Santa Claus, it would be cave climbing on Mars. Now, this is a non-trivial task first, because doing this in a spacesuit, in a space environment, that's an engineering nightmare, I can tell you. So what we did, um, previous missions, for example, go to uh, subsurface areas like the, the Dachstein Giant Ice Cave in Upper Austria, a tremendously impressive area where we know there are old ices there. Uh, we were going in there with our spacesuits, uh, which, with a few native modifications. We had to lay out you know, directional wireless LAN, uh, hundreds of meters below the surface. We had hundreds of meters of cables to be laid out. Um, we had uh, geo-radars with us to look into hundreds of years old ice layers on the, uh, in the subsurface structures there. And it was really amazing. And if you look at those pictures you see here in the, in the slides here, the, these are amazing in terms of what, kind of you, what, what you can do. The bottom line for those missions is we always have to consider that Mars analog missions are happening on two worlds, Mars and on Earth, and both are equally important. So you have to mimic things like the time delay because the communication cannot happen in real time. The average time delay between Earth and Mars is somewhere in the order of about 10 minutes one way. So once you have a problem on, on Mars, it takes at least 20 minutes until it's only acknowledged from Earth, not to say that they send you some solutions or so. So this is a operational constraint we're trying to include in our missions as well. And there have been many so far. We have 10 missions that have been conducted and in August 2015 we're going for an even bigger mission at 3,000 meters altitude, but I'll tell you about this in, in, in a few minutes or so. The reason why we choose our sites is because they, are look, they look like Mars. And looking like Mars doesn't necessarily mean only by the visual appearance, but also that, for example, the, the grain size distribution, the kind of minerals we're expecting there, you know, minerals that have been in long-standing contact with water, for example. These are the parameters when we're choosing our sites. And if you look at this picture here, this is really, I mean, speaks for itself while we're going, for example, in the northern Sahara of Morocco. The picture on the left was taken on the 15th of February 2013, right after a dust storm, which means it's not Photoshop. Yes, and the sky does look like this. It's not a blue sky anymore because there are so many dust particles in the air. The picture on the right side, you see, that was taken just one week afterwards at the bottom of Mount Sharp by the Mars Science-led Curiosity. So that means these two pictures, they are one week separated, but they're two worlds apart. And if you wouldn't know which is which, and if I wouldn't say they're like, this is Morocco and this is Mars, even specialists probably would have difficulties identifying which is which planet. So whenever you do those missions, you, of course, yes, you are not on Mars, but you are not on Earth either. You're somewhere in limbo, mentally speaking, so to say. And this is the important thing about it, because then you are taking it serious that once you have a problem with the spacesuit, it could kill you on Mars, and you're taking those things really seriously uh, on Earth. So before we go to those areas, we do a lot of assessment, we do a geological analysis, we do precursor samplings. We're allowing ourselves to emulate the precursor missions you would have on Mars as well for a human mission. 
The reason for this is a very simple one, because we have one fundamental, very nasty problem in Mars analog or in analog research in, in general. Now, when we do spaceflight missions, we always know what kind of data we got. We know what kind of pictures, what the magnetic field measurements said, what the temperatures were, and so on and so on and so forth. The problem is we do not know what we could have found if we would have looked at a different location with a different set of instruments at a different time. So we do not know what we missed. We never have a sense for the completeness of our samples. Now in geology on Earth, that's not a big deal because you just return to the, to the first site and do a second sampling, for example, maybe a year afterwards. In spaceflight, this is very hard to do because it's expensive. Now, you sometimes only have one shot to do it. And so we are devising mechanisms and workflows and instrumentation decisions that once we go to Mars, that if we find something or we do not find something, we can be maybe not sure, but we have a good feeling that we didn't overlook something important. And so we, we're trying to get to, to areas which are well characterized from a geological point of view, like this part of Morocco. But we do not allow our engineers and scientists to, to read any geology book about Morocco. They're not just not allowed to do it. We blind ourselves. And we're only allowed to use the data we are devising from remote sensing and from the in-situ experiments we conduct once we're there. And from that, we try to create an as complete picture as possible to study that area. And after that, we do the unblinding, which means we then compare the ground truth, which has been well established many years ago, with the things we found and compare the delta. And the little, the, 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 the less this delta gets, the better we get. Uh, so that's the idea behind analog research, that you are trying to study with the tools at hand you would have for Mars as well and see if these are the right instruments, so to say. So you do, yes, you do, context mapping. You have to be very careful in choosing the sites for various reasons. Is it the right position to do the experiment? Is it a safe site? Do you have to like block off the, the uh, entire area? Like for Morocco, for example, the Moroccan government was tremendously supportive to our work. They had to close out with, with, um, with the Gendarmerie Royale, the military police forces, to basically close off five kilometers uh, from the experimental site to make sure that nobody else would be accessing uh, the area that were really undisturbed in our research. And that was a, a big, big thank you to the American, Moroccan government for, for giving us this, this freedom of operation, actually. So once you have these geographical maps, you do geological mapping. You do a terrain risk mapping, saying, well, where are the steep cliffs where you want to avoid a rover to go or where you need aerial reconnaissance or where there's no-go zone for the astronauts, for example. Then you match this with suitability maps, basically saying, well, what kind of experiment can be conducted at which site, for example, complemented by Wi-Fi coverage, which basically tells you where can you go to, to maintain your communication. If you main, and if you combine all those maps, and this is our, you know, these are almost like hyperspectral data, we have many layers of information on single maps, these are then translated into the flight plans because then everybody says, well, I need as many hours for the Geo-Rater, I need so many hours for doing this experiment. There's this constant struggle for probably the most precious resource we have in human spaceflight, and that's the astronaut time. So they really compete like in a bazaar uh, where they really try to, you know, uh, trade. Yeah, you get a little bit more of power from my experiment and some of my bandwidth, but for that I want to have 15 minutes extra time for the analog astronauts, and, and they are really competitive on that. So we have to balance a lot of things. So to balance this, you need the people behind the scenes, and these are the people of Mission Support Center. Without them, there would never be a mission. Yeah, so the analog astronauts, they are the most visible part of the public maybe, but they are by far not the most important ones. Without flight planners, you wouldn't have a mission, for example. So we had to call for the volunteers. And you have to say that, that those people are, I mean, they, they pay for themselves, they take the vacation, they're doing all, the, they, learn, they learn a lot, they, they take exams and so on. So these are people who are really dedicated in a way. And uh, we always hold it like uh, this famous folk from uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the uh, uh, author of uh, Le Petit Prince, uh, when he says, if you want to build a ship, do not only teach the people how to put together the wooden planks, but make them long for the ocean. And that's exactly what we do, because we are very carefully choosing the people who are, who are manning the mission support center, but we're also making them aware that what they're doing is nothing less than building the ships and building the workflows, basically for the grandest voyage of our generation, so to say. So yeah, we need the people. So we had to select a new team of analog astronauts. These are people who are very, very carefully chosen. We had, a, for the, the current class, which is uh, just about to finish their basic training, we have five of them right now. They were chosen from 100 uh, applicants across all over Europe and, and overseas as well. So they were, go they were going through 600, 
37 test batteries in total, uh, checking for psychology, physiological test, uh, team fitness, team fitting, uh, endurance, uh, ability to uh, you know, adapt to various environments. Um, so right now we're having the only standing analog astronaut core uh, in Europe ready to go for those missions. And they come from all walks of life. They come from all walks of uh, technical backgrounds. You see here a group image of them that's in the front row. Joao Lozado, aerospace engineer. Carmen Köhler, uh, she's a weather researcher in the German Weather Services. Karti Kumar, he's uh, hailing from the Netherlands. Top pro on the left is Inigo Munoz de Lorza. He's uh, from Spain, also an aerospace engineer. He usually works uh, with the Galileo constellation, for example. And uh, on the uh, top, uh, top row on the right here, we have Stefan Dobrovolny. He's the only astronaut uh, who is from from Austria actually right now. So uh, we have a very diverse group here, which has been very carefully selected and trained. The question is, what do they do once they are in the field? Now, let me show you some of the type of experiments we are conducting when we're doing this kind of missions. So this is a typical look into the uh, base station, uh, where you have the operations box, where you collect all the telemetry data from the spacesuits, where you have a real-time telemetry available because this is the logical representation of the habitation model on Mars. So when you uh, drive a rover, you would do it from there. You would not do it from Earth because of the time delay. So all the data get compiled here in this hub and that then transferred to the satellite and from the satellite back to the mission support center, which I'm going to show you in a few seconds as well. So you have rovers, like this is uh, the Magma rover from uh, our Polish friends from the uh, Polish Mars Society and ABM Space Education, team around Mateusz Josefowicz. And this is a team which is uh, carrying an Austrian experiment. Actually, that's one I'm involved as well. That's a life laser. That's a biofluorescence marker laser, where you basically have a laser system to, uh, to shoot at a rock. And if you have biomarker molecules, there's a fluorescence signal coming back. And this is a very efficient system and very, very, very sensitive system where it can go to like like down to a few nanograms per square centimeter of, for example, phycoerythrins or porphyrins or uh, any kind of a biological molecule you can otherwise consume depending on the frequency you're looking into. We're also studying human, human robotic uh, interaction. Like here you see a picture of the CliffBot. Uh, the CliffBot is uh, done by the uh, French Mars Society, Association Planet Mars, the group of Alain Souchier where you have basically a, a rope guided rover which you let down the cliff and has a high resolution camera and some in other instruments on board which allow you to study areas which are too dangerous for the human to access. And it's a very lightweighted, very simple construction which can be deployed almost everywhere. We also use it in the, uh, in the ice caves, for example, but it enables you to have an extended look uh, for the astronauts. You can lower it to like in 100 meters or so and still get some, some decent imagery from down there. So this is very interesting because the lower you go, go down on, on the cliffs when you have the, the sediment lines in there from geological point of view, you are actually flipping the pages of a book which tells you what was the story of that particular site. So the lower you go down, usually, depends on the kind, type of site or so, the more back you go in history and it tells you what happened there actually for millions of years before. Another rover, uh, which is here, doesn't really look like a classical rover. It doesn't even have wheels or tracks or so. This is the Puri rover team from uh, Budapest, from Hungary. And uh, they having a, actually they are, to be honest, they are on the wrong planet because it's a uh, competitor for the Google Luna X Prize competition, which is paying out prize money to people who are able to privately finally go to the moon and, and roll there for 500 meters. So it's on the wrong planet because it's not supposed to be on the moon. However, of course, traverse planning and uh, all the uh, terrain negotiations, this is something that a rover can also study in the North of Sahara as well. So it doesn't have wheels, doesn't have tracks, but it has Wax. Wax is an artificial word uh, uh, mixed out of wheels and legs. And so it actually can walk on the ground. So you can go over stairs, for example, you go over really rough terrain with boulder sizes, which are bigger than, than, than the wheels themselves. So that's a, this is a pretty impressive way of mobility scheme. And uh, if you look at uh, crawling, it, it looks really fantastic. And it's a completely different approach of how to work. And, and speaking about things you only learn in the field, uh, you see in the background here the magma rover as well. So um, one thing we stumbled across, we, to be honest, we have never thought about that is, but if you have the magma rover telecommanded from Toron in Poland and uh, Budapest is telecommanding the, um, the magma rover and the astronauts are telecommanded by, by Innsbruck, by the mission support center, the main mission support center sits, you have three different devices controlled by three different uh, control mechanisms and three different centers. 
which means if you don't do it in a clever way, you risk the first simulated interplanetary traffic accident because the one rolls over the other or so. That's something you want to avoid, of course. And if you have time delay, this is quite an issue, actually. So we thought about, okay, well, if you have more than one rover, you have to have kind of a traffic management system on Mars as well. And that's something we haven't thought of before. We were looking into a twin mission we had uh, back in Utah, the Mars Satellite Research Station back at that time. And we thought, what if you are not only having one mission on Mars, but you have two separate landing teams, like the Spirit Opportunity Lander, the lander of opposite sides of the, of the planet. How about you do the same thing with the, with the humans? Because it wouldn't double the cost, but on the other hand, it would uh, increase you know, resilience or, or uh, they, they could help each other if there's a problem. They can, just by the mere fact that they're on the same planet, they can allow for, for you know, real-time communication, for example, or making up for you know, a, a relay station or so. Now, this is uh, something which not a lot of people have been thinking about before. So really switching to one mission to the other with the same mission support center or so, that's a, a workflow which is absolutely non-trivial because the question is what kind of situation awareness do you need as a flight controller to be able to take over a foreign mission which you haven't been training with eh? and still make it a safe way. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. There was a lot of issues we discovered just by stumbling across those crazy ideas. So the, the bottom line here is that, that while we are not a big agency in any way, eh? but we are, we are a fast group. We can, we can try out the crazy things. We can try the, the wild ideas before you really go through the major processes which are more slowly and bigger and on the agency side. But, but have quick evaluations, so to say. Also, one of those things, and that's, that makes me a little bit pr proud to be an Austrian, and I'm sometimes waving the Austrian flag a little bit higher, is that uh, contingency situations. And now, the problem is, what if you sprain an ankle, if you break a leg on Mars, uh, and you cannot walk back to the, to the Martian habitat? At one point or another, you will be running out of consumables in the space, you're gonna die. So what are you gonna do? You have to spend the night outside before the rescue team might approach you the next day because it's maybe too late in the day, so you cannot do an ABA in the nighttime anymore. Now, what do you do as an Austrian when you go mountaineering and you get stuck in the mountains? Well, you have a bivouac tent with you. You have this little folded tent with you where you sit in the right places and you unfold your tent and you stay there and survive. So the question was, can we design an equivalent of a mountaineering emergency tent for space purposes. And yes, as you can imagine, we did. We call it the deployable shelter developed with the uh, Technical University of Vienna and the direction of uh, Sandor Heibrich Meisburger, where we had a, a system which is folded in a, about a wheel sized structure, about that size here. And once you are in trouble, you unzip it, you push it to the right places, and it goes flip, 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 and you have what you see here in the image now. It's, a, it's like a, a beach bag, yeah, a big one. You crawl inside, you have gas compressor with you, you have power source with you, you switch it on and it's inflating. You have inflatable furniture inside. Depending on how you put the hydraulics, you can have a sofa, you can have a table, whatever you like. Huh? And you close the entire thing, you seal it off, which you see in the next picture, I think, and then you can take off the helmet inside because you can pressurize it and you can survive one night. The only thing we forgot to put in was the in-flight entertainment from the evening movie. So next time we're gonna put in a small beamer, but otherwise it's really a nice structure which is really easy to deploy and, and it's, it's made for two astronauts to survive one night out there. So that's actually a kind of a spinning from mountaineering space style. With a lot of other experiments, this is just a rough run through of some selected experiments like a, the Hanveyer station, that's a surveyor uh, based design from back from the, from the moon landings, were done by the Erdvesh Laurent University in Hungary, uh, which is an automated environmental, environmental station we were looking into uh, together with NASA JPL with uh, contamination testing to see how clean can you work in this space suit and so on. So that was the Mars part. On the other side, on the other planet, on the Earth, there was also a lot of evolution going on in the past year. So we had, we had a uh, really a very simple mission support infrastructure in the very beginning. I'll show you a few pictures, and, and I know some of those pictures might look even a little bit embarrassing, but these were the early days of the Austrian Space Forum uh, activities. So, so uh, what, what I'm trying to say, is it's not, you need, don't need a big agency, you don't need a big company for those things. As soon as you have people with a passion for space, people with uh, the technological capabilities, you can do anything. That's the one thing you learn that Spaceflight has, uh, has taught us. Nothing is impossible. So bear with me how cumbersome and how humble our beginnings were in the beginning. So this was a picture of our first mission support center. One guy, two computers, three screens, and lots of cables. That's all we had 
to at least receive the telemetry of the space suit. Just afterwards, we had like one, two, three, four, five, six guys with uh, six computers and a couple of radios when we had already uh, the suit uh, more adva an advanced version with uh, some experiments. Uh, we went underground with an even more simplified version of the mission support center where we had to build our own computers but the others, because the others were just freezing to death in the ice cave, for example. So there's a lot of things you learn along the way and you have to pay your, your, your tuition fees uh, to, to the environment, so to say. We went up to uh, the Kaunatal Glacier at almost 3,000 meters altitude for the first glacier walking test where we did some um, um, checkouts from a technological point of view from the suit, for example. And so it continued throughout the Rio Tinto Mission Support Center, the Dachshan Mission Support Center, to where we are right now. And it's actually a, an entire floor of a building where we have many rooms where they have the flight control team, the uh, remote science support team, you have the flight planning team, you have uh, the people who do the ground support, the media team, and so forth and so on. So it's a pretty big infrastructure you need for actually operating this. You need the servers, you need the you know, backup lines, you need power generators just in case if you have a, a problem with the power supply. You need to make sure you have enough volunteers to stuff it for, for almost 24 hours. So it's a um, pretty big infrastructure. Right now in Europe we're the only group which is having this kind of infrastructure at the moment. So you, you hear a, a brief overview about the, uh, the uh, organigram, the chain of command basically. So it's surprisingly similar to what you have uh, during the early space flights with a, a flight director, which is the conductor of the orchestra, so to say, a flight control team with, uh, with a CAPCOM, or we call it EarthCOM nowadays, biomedical engineers, science liaisons, IT team, science data officers, for example. So there's a quasi-military structure. And the reason for this is that you have to be able to process data and make decisions out of those data as soon as possible in almost real time. And this is a system where a lot of discussion is not the most efficient way how to work. So you need a, a well-trained crew for that. For instance, for the flight planning where you are telling whom to do what, why, with which resources, where, and when. And if you have like you know, 12 people in the field, for example, that's a typical field crew size, you have at least the same amount of people in the background who are preparing this. So like typically like a half a year before the action mission, we know already what kind of activities are gonna happen when to really optimize the resources we have. The same for the remote science support, which is interacting with the flight planning, with the flight controllers, is monitoring, are the analog astronauts doing the right stuff? Are they following the procedures in the correct way? Did they do something wrong? Are the data valuable? Uh, do they mean anything for us? Yeah, I mean, just taking data itself, that's, that's one step, right? but really translating data into knowledge and that take the knowledge for having an operative uh, impact on the actual flight planning, then that's something where you need very well-defined um, um, uh, patterns, workflows, which are not coming by themselves. You have to train them, you have to device them, you have to have a feedback loop after the missions, you have to get better and better after each mission. So that's what the remote science support does. So it does this supports the development of the hardware and the procedures. It does also the analog astronaut training from the science point of view. It does the near real-time data analysis. And believe me, this is non-trivial thing. Many research are not used to real-time data analysis. They do the post-mission data analysis. And they also devise the multi-mission science roadmap. So as opposed to many other field trips or, or smaller missions, which are one of their kind, they're conducted with public funding, but they're not pursued afterwards anymore. Huh? And you lose that knowledge. You don't build up a body of knowledge unless for the things you publish in peer-reviewed journals. But that's not the entire uh, the knowledge. There's something we call the tasty knowledge, which you don't publish, but it's still in the, in the teams. So you have to build up a culture of maintaining that knowledge. So one uh, way to do this is, for example, is the science data of archive, which is a, a ever-growing multi-mission archive where all the telemetry data from the suits, all the science data are stored. So those missions were in a sequence with increasing complexity, larger teams, more science, and we're getting to a point where we really know how to use the suits now, and they're really getting efficient and, and safer. Now, we've taken all this knowledge now and are currently preparing for a major upcoming mission. In uh, August this year, we are preparing for the MD-15 mission. Now, MD-15 will be the highest ever conducted uh, human Mars simulation ever at 3,000 meters altitude on a glacier and a rock glacier in the Austrian Alps in the Kaunertal, which is a fantastic area even to go without a spacesuit, by the way. 
But what we, what we are doing there, we are emulating the investigations of what human Mars explorers might do one day on the Martian glacier, because Martian glaciers, in addition to Martian caves, are one of those astrobiological hotspots where we would love to search for all life forms, so to say. Now, the idea, the idea behind this is that we, we investigate the limitations and opportunities of starting a Martian rock glacier with human explorers using state-of-the-art instrumentations. Like a, it's, it's a showcasing as well of, of what is possible with Mars analog research with top-notch organizations which are joining us. So the Austrian Space Forum is just the underlying infrastructure uh, on which uh, we have uh, 12 very carefully selected coherent experiments together ranging from human factors to astrobiology to uh, geological exploration, to robotics, uh, to spacesuit design, and so on, including a dedicated outreach and uh, education component, so to say. And it's also a, a mechanism and infrastructure to test novel mission support strategies, like decision-making workflows, near real-time data analysis for the flight planning, or the science behind it. Because you don't have the luxury when you go to Mars to study data for a month until you take a decision if you want to take a rock sample on that particular spot or not. You have to be much flexible. You have to take into account, yes, it might not be perfect, but it's fast. And that's the big big thing, which is the difference as opposed to, 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 to the moon missions, for example. And just to give you one example of what we're doing, and that's something where we really have the feeling we are privileged because we're touching the future on this. And that is our virtualization of spacewalks. The idea is that um, together with the Italian Mars Society, uh, we are devising the so-called Vera's famous experiment, which means it's a combination of an Oculus Rift goggle, you know, 3D goggles, where you're standing in an omnidirectional treadmill, which means you're in a climbing harness, or almost like, like in a climbing harness, and you walk in any direction you like, but you don't, you're not moving because you're in a very, very, very slippery surface. You seem to be walking, but you don't move. At the same time, a Microsoft Connect is recording you, which means you are translating all the information of a walking human into the Oculus Rift. Now, the nice thing about this is, as this is a, a Blender-based uh, virtual reality system, is that you can modify the physics engine behind this, which means you can just switch off Earth gravity and switch on Mars gravity by one third. And this is really amazing. I've, I've, one week ago, we had a, a, a trial test here in the Space Laboratory of the Austrian Space Forum, where you can actually hop on Mars, you can walk around, you can run on Mars, you can drive a buggy on Mars, you can walk into a virtual reality space station, look around and see all the, you know, the, the greenhouse and the, the, the bunk rooms and so on. You have a computer, a virtual computer in this virtual station where you have a screen where you can do a video telecon inside this virtual station. So now the idea behind this is we're not just having one of the stations, we're gonna have four of them, two on the rock glacier and two uh, in the base station and one and two of them in the um, mission support center where we also have uh, the multi-gravity station where you have a harness which is elevated uh, to take away two thirds of your weight basically, that we offer the fly planners the opportunity for the first time to actually simulate in advance the traverses the analog astronauts should do the next day then you have, after the EVA has actually been conducted, you can allow the remote science support people, the researchers, to re-enact those EVAs and making sure that, that nothing else, nothing important has been overlooked and say, well, they, oh, you walked by that particular rock, you should have taken a, a rock sample. Can we channel this into the next flight plan, for example? And as we have two stations on the mountain, we can have two analog astronauts in our outer space source, right on the surface of the glacier, while two more of them having a separate EVA with the same communication telemetry. They are totally included from, from the mission support center. You don't, you don't see a difference, basically. You still get their telemetry and so on, but they are on Mars virtually. We have digital elevation models of both the countertile and Mars as well. So we have one EVA on Mars and the other one is on Mars slash Canada as well. We can even blend in with those virtual reality systems in a way. But it means that we have a blended simulation where we have both physical exhausted uh, analog astronauts in the suits and mentally ch or cognitively challenged analog astronauts in the system. We're gonna see how this is gonna work out because it also means that you have not only one analog astronaut which can keep the entire mission support center busy, but we have four of them. And we'll see how our processes, our workflows, our chain of commands are efficient enough to, to actually conduct such a multi-person EVA. And that's something we are really looking forward to it, and that's something nobody has done before. So it's, it's uh, because it, th those things help us to, to ask new questions that we would have thought of. And this is, I think, the, one of those bottom lines. 
I, I try to share when people ask, oh, why, why are you doing this? And, and are you going to sell a product afterwards? No, we're not going to sell a product. Our, our product is knowledge and experience. We're asking the right questions. So I would rather not only consider this as a, you know, a fun exercise for science, but more of a, I would actually say I'd consider this as a kind of a Rosetta Stone to unlock and unleash questions and dreams that nobody has been dreamed of before. And that's what we are doing. It's nothing less than preparing the grandest journey of a generation. And I think our time will be remembered as the time when we broke the, the cosmic shores and went uh, to become a multiplanetary species. And I'm very proud to be part of this. And you should be too.